Here I'll be reading an article from the March 1989 issue of Byte Magazine. Uh, this article is written by Bruce Eckel. Pretty good one because his personality really shines through. He's going to teach us quite a bit about a term I don't often see, EEPROM. Maybe somebody who works in embedded systems or on embedded controllers, which is just a very specific microcomputer, would be more familiar with this term. But if nothing else, by the end of this article, you'll know it well. And at a time when computers were very expensive, this was an interesting project. At one point in the article, well, near the end, it gets very technical. So just consider jumping to the, con the humorous conclusion. And this might seem like caveman-style programming, but I like it. Turning a PC into an embedded control system. Phase 1. Interfacing EE proms to the PC bus. And this is written by Bruce Eckel. And I never noticed this before, but I think they put his address below his name in the magazine. Unless that's the address of his consulting firm. I typed out the correct spelling right above here. I think it's pronounced Isis Consulting. Which, if that's the pronunciation here in 2023, we think of something else when we think of ISIS. Anyways, he writes, In the coming months, I'll be working piece by piece on an ambitious project, turning a PC motherboard into an embedded control system. In this issue, I'll start by showing you how to use non-volatile memory, or EEPROM, which stands for Electrically Erasable Programmable Read-Only Memory. Embedded controllers are standalone systems generally dedicated to a single task. They usually don't include monitors or disk drives, but sometimes do have a very simple keyboard or display. You hear a lot about the microcomputers in telephones, toasters, toilets, and televisions. These embedded controllers on a single chip have been optimized for cost. Single chip microcontrollers are ideal for situations where you make thousands of products because the design costs can be spread out. These costs are, of course, significant. While I was at Fluke in Seattle, I programmed a 4-bit microcontroller designed by Nick. So he programmed a 4-bit microcontroller to drive a vacuum fluorescent display directly. You know, like the one on your VCR. This involved learning the hardware characteristics of a chip and a very arcane assembly language. We had to develop and debug the assembler while writing the code, with little in the way of examples or English documentation. All this work was expensive. However, since it was going into a meter, with projected sales of 15 to 25,000 per year, the costs were insignificant compared to the price of using, for instance, a Z80 with the necessary peripheral support chips. Many companies can't justify the cost of building everything from scratch, and here's a rapid growing industry which supplies various types of PC environment embedded systems. These include normal PC hardware with a special BIOS, which doesn't look for disk drives, etc., and often a ROMed version of DOS. So that's a read-only version of DOS. Systems like this allow you to develop your embedded systems using the powerful compilers and tools available on the PC. Commercial PC environment embedded systems tend to be expensive. Not as expensive as most other alternatives, but often as expensive as an XT with a hard disk. The prices drop dramatically if you get in a volume. My favorite example is Intel's Wildcard 88, which has the core of an XT motherboard on a card 2 inches by 4 inches. Unfortunately, there isn't any RAM, and Intel spokesman said, we don't like RAM. Okay, that's not what they said. They said, we don't make RAM, so why should we put on or put any on the board? But these boards are only $50 a piece, and lots of $1,000. Since XT motherboards are under $100, and you don't need the usual hefty power supply, since there won't be any disk drives, why can't we build our own embedded controller, in quantities of one, with the power and development environment of a PC for under $200? So here are the tricky parts, figuring out how to modify or write from scratch the ROM BIOS. Next is using RAM, probably static RAM since it was less powerful and doesn't need refreshing. Establishing non-volatile memory since we don't have disk drives. 
and he puts in parentheses the subject of this article. And then writing C or C++ embedded applications and burning them into EEPROM. This is a big tricky ticket and it's going to take us several issues before we have all the nooks and crannies explored and worked out. But that's where we're headed. EEPROM allows you to store information not lost when you power down. It's like an EEPROM which doesn't require EEPROM burner. It gets burned right in the circuit. EEPROMs take much longer to write than they do to read. The read cycle is on the same order as normal memory. You can only write to a memory location of an EEPROM a limited number of times. For the chip I'll talk about here, it's 10,000. However, there's no restriction on the number of times you can read. Normally, you erase an EEPROM by writing over old data, but new crops of flash erasable chips are showing up. Embedded systems often use EEPROMs as long-term storage for state information, since there are no disks, or for storage of information which can't rely on the presence of a disk. Remember, this is March 1989. As these get cheaper, it becomes feasible to begin using them to store large amounts of data. Several companies make cards containing EEPROM with ROMed DOS and large amounts of EEPROM. These cards look like bootable DOS disks. You simply load your program onto the EEPROM and install it in your target system as Drive A. So the computer boots from the card. This looks like it might be an alternative way to create an embedded system from a PC. However, the price of these cards has always been too high for me. I selected the chip for this project by going to the back pages of Byte and looking for EE proms. I always try to use easy to find parts, but sometimes people still have trouble, so I felt this was the safest approach. And that's funny, he is citing another magazine while writing for Micro Cornucopia. So good to know, Bruce Eccle reads Byte magazine just like we do. He goes on to write, this part is a Samsung KM2816A25. I don't know why they put the dash here. That's where the dash goes, right before the 25. And this is 2K by 8 bit. That is 2K bytes. TTL compatible, 5 volt only EEPROM. The 25 in the part designation refers to the 250 nanosecond read time. It's available through Jamco for $6, but they have to do a minimum order of $20. I suggest you get the data sheet, 50 cents extra. And then he gives the Jamco Electronics address, which is in Belmont, California. And I've supplied the correct spelling of Jamco now. I've never heard of this company. If you need a denser part, the 2865A30 is 8K bytes for only $10. It should be easy to modify my design for that part. Many EE proms require special hardware support for the extra long write cycle, or they may have other interfacing requirements, like higher write voltages, for example. The 2816A chip was designed to interface directly to a microprocessor bus. It only requires 5 volts for reading and writing, and has internal hardware to latch the write value. You use the same kind of bus cycle to write to the EEPROM as you do to RAM. The pinout is the same as a common 6116 static RAM. You can just drop it into the same socket if the bus timing is within specs. The only caveat is you must wait 10 milliseconds between writes. In an embedded application with hardware dedicated to a special task, it would be appropriate to take over some of the PC's memory space for EEPROM. Some for static RAM, lower power, fast, no wait states, and no refreshing necessary. And some for the program, EEPROM. On a general purpose PC, however, we can't dedicate any of the memory space to EEPROM, so I've designed it to use the I.O. space. Even then, there isn't enough free I.O. space to support 2,000 bytes. Only 10 lines, or 1K, of I.O. is brought out to the PC bus with much of that dedicated to other purposes. To test the EEPROM, I've designed a card which occupies eight I.O. addresses. For an introduction to designing PC adapter cards, see my article in Micro C issue number 43. The card only uses three of the addresses you write 
address and control line information to base and base plus one. These are write only, by the way. You write data to and read data from base plus two. Once again, I've taken a chip design to interface directly to a bus and made it independent of the bus through a combination of hardware and software. Maybe it's a step backward, but I find it a very useful technique for testing hardware. Two latches were added to hold the address and control lines to the EE prom. The rest is done in software. Reading the chip is a two-step process. First, you write the address to base, latching it onto the 2816's pins. And force CE, which stands for chip enable, and OE, which stands for output enable. So you force chip enable low by writing to base one. So these lines are active now. Then you can read data from base two, plus two. You can save power by raising the CE line, again, a write to base plus one, following the read. While unnecessary in our system, this happens automatically if the chip is interfaced to a bus. For a write cycle, you send the address base and data base plus two to the chip. Then you enable the chip by dropping CE. Here, OE must be high since we're writing to the chip. Outputs are not enabled. Finally, you lower and raise the WE line to generate a write pulse. And though it doesn't say here, I assume WE stands for write enable. After the write, you raise the CE line to disable the chip and then twiddle your thumbs for 10 milliseconds to make sure another write doesn't happen too quickly. This isn't necessary if you have some other insurance that your program won't write a byte more often than once every 10 milliseconds. To write large quantities of data while performing other tasks, you might want to use an interrupt routine tied to a clock tick. In a system where the EE prom ties directly to the microprocessor bus, the microprocessor and the decoding logic generate signals to the chip. So they look other than they do here. In that situation, you must examine the timing on your bus and compare it to the spec sheets for the 2816A. So this next section is titled Circuit Notes. You'll notice I left off the power and ground pins on the chips. I drew the diagram with ORCAD, what a powerful and wonderful program, and the parts came from the library this way, which is very common on circuit diagrams. Fortunately, there's a pattern. If you look down at the top of the chip with pin 1 in the upper left corner, you'll see the lower left pin as ground and the upper right pin as power. And I just wanted to make sure we spelled ORCAD correctly there. Another hidden feature, every two or three TTL chips, you should put a capacitor with a value of 0.01 to 0.1 UF between power and ground to keep TTL noise from propagating through the supply lines. And these are called bypass capacitors. The editor puts a note here, bypasses should be low impedance ceramic or plastic capacitors, and you should keep their leads as short as possible. In fact, it doesn't hurt to have one tied between plus five volts and ground at every IC. Also add three or four 10 to 50 UF tantalum capacitors between the five volt line and any other supply lines and ground. Tantalums are polarized, like common electrolytics. So be sure someone shows you which lead is plus. Also tantalums have a voltage rating. Those rated at 20 volts or greater will work fine for five volt and 12 volt supplies. The dip switch controls address selection. I've shown it as optional since you can simply write the lines to ground or leave them open. To select an address for base of 0x220, generally an unused address, ground all lines except A5SEL and A9SEL. What does SEL stand for? The backslashes after signal names denote not or active low. And that's the backslash we're talking about. So this denotes not or active low. For quick breadboarding, you can get a super strip card that plugs into the PC bus from Global Specialties. The part number is PB88 or PB882. They also have a new proto development card with all the decoding and buffering done for you.
Next time, I may get distracted from embedded systems sooner than I expected. I was cruising Radio Shack the other day and saw a pair of nifty LSI chips, which, combined with some hardware, create speech. I know speech projects are popular, and it seems like a PC adapter card to generate speech could be a lot of fun. Embedded systems, C++, speech synthesis, PCB cards. There are just too many fascinating products waiting to be created. (laughs) <laughs> and in 2023, that is still very true, if not more so, because you have people like me going back in time to investigate these guys' projects. Well, thanks for watching.